Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Claudia Rizzini, the Executive Director of the Fellowship Program at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Ruth Grossman, our Mary Beth and Chris Gordon Fellow. Within a single second, we form first impressions of others we interact with, which profoundly shape our mental image of people and our assumptions of future interactions. Ruth is fascinated by the milliseconds that shape these initial perceptions. More specifically, she is interested in how perceptions of autism spectrum disorder influence the first encounter of and interactions with autistic people. Using cutting edge 3D motion capture, eye tracking and modeling, Ruth produces empirical data to quantify the facial and vocal expressions that lead to negative impacts of social perceptions of autism. Her groundbreaking work in 2015 and 2017 found that neurotypical adolescents are less willing to interact with their autistic peers based on judgment formed from one second audio and video clips. Ruth's work demonstrate how social norms around communication and biases determine the perception of autistic people's social competencies. Biases also determine who gets diagnosed with autism. As many as 80% of autistic girls remained undiagnosed, a vestige of the historical bias that defines autism as a disorder among males. During her year at Radcliffe, Ruth is conducting research to radically rethink how the intersectionality between gender and autism have caused under-identification and misdiagnosis of autistic women and girls. Her work offers pathways towards a better understanding of the communicative differences between autistic and non-autistic individuals to help improve social engagement and inclusion. It is a great pleasure to welcome Ruth Grossman to the podium. Thank you. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you, Claudia, for that lovely introduction. Um, so in today's talk, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an arc of my previous work, how I got to where I am now, the insights gained during this year at Ratcliffe, and then a little bit of a glimpse into what happens next. But first, I wanna thank uh, the Ratcliffe Institute for uh, choosing me for this experience. The entire Face Lab team who are here, on the screen, my home institution of Emerson College for letting me go for the year, um, and especially all the research participants who very generously gave their time and their energy and their insights into moving this work forward. Um, I'm very, very grateful for all the people who've spoken with me, taught me, inspired me, um, and I just wanna make it clear that any and all errors in what I'm about to say are entirely their fault. So with that, what is autism? Just to make sure that we're all on the same page, couple of basics. Um, autism is a developmental condition, which means that signs and symptoms of autism emerge in early childhood. Uh, the current incidence, according to the Centers for Disease Control, is about one in 36. Um, and according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5th edition, the DSM-5, it is currently diagnosed along two main domains. The first being so difficulties with social interaction and social communication something like difficulty maintaining a conversation, differences in how facial expressions are produced, which is one of the things that I'm particularly interested in, difficulty um, building and maintaining friendships. Uh, and the other domain is repetitive and re uh, stereotyped behaviors and interests, and that can show up in repetitive motor movements, such as hand flapping or verbal um, expressions that get repeated again and again. Um, it can also be sort of an intense interest in a certain topic or an insistence on sameness and routines. Um, there is a wide range of manifestations of autism across the entire autism community. I'm only gonna be speaking about one segment of that, which is autistic individuals who have cognitive and language skills that fall within the normal range. 
and a little bit on terminology before we really dive in. So since 1943, since autism was first described, we've really been talking about it within a medical model, talking about a disorder, talking about deficits, talking about uh, really putting the onus of um, of repairing any kinds of interactional difficulties on autistic individuals to behave more typically, right? Um, since then, last few years, we've really been shifting a lot more to a social model that uh, recognizes things as differences and recognizes strengths of autistic individuals. Um, and there is this double empathy model that was introduced by Damian Milton about a decade ago that uh, talks about when a conversation between an autistic and a non-autistic person goes awry, it is really on both of them to un better understand what the communicative strategies of the other person were and to try and repair that communicative breakdown. So it is the role of both autistic and non-autistic people to develop that empathy, to develop that understanding and learn about how the other side communicates in order to improve interaction. Um, and this is also, this social model is also where this neurodiversity movement lives, which I'm sure you've been hearing about, um, that recognizes autism as one of the diverse ways in which human brains function. And so autism is one aspect of neurodiversity. Um, I just want to make a note that that doesn't mean that autistic people don't also have a disability, which is something that we can also talk about during Q&A if people are more interested to talk about that. And the last little bit is about terminology. So I'm trained as a speech language pathologist. Clinically speaking, we always use person first language, or that's the strong preference. So somebody is a person with Parkinson's disease, a person with cerebral palsy. A lot of autistic individuals actually prefer identity first language with the justification that they can't layer the autism out of themselves, right? They are who they are. Autism is part and parcel of of their being, and so they prefer identity first language. They refer to themselves as an autistic person or an autist or an Aspie or whatever terminology people choose for themselves. Uh, this is, uh, I'm gonna be using mostly identity first language um, in this talk. That is by no means universally accepted preference. So if you find yourself in an interaction with or about autistic individual, it's always best practice to listen how they use the language. Um, and if you're not sure, just ask. Um, all right, first impressions. Why do we care about first impressions? We care about first impressions because there's decades of literature telling us that they matter, that we form very quick first impressions that have a long-lasting impact on how we interact with each other. Even if we get contrary evidence, we kind of stick with our first impressions for quite some time. And if you uh, scour the internet, you're going to find a lot of sites devoted to the importance of first impressions, you're going to find information on research studies looking at the factors that influence first impressions, you're going to find guides on what to do in order to make a good first impression and things to avoid. Um, the work that I'm talking about, or that, that I've been doing, leans very heavily on the work of Nalini Ambadi, who coined this term of thin slice judgments, where she's capturing not just the still image and impressions about that, but something about the interactional quality of people as well. So one example is she recorded um, audio conversations between a surgeon, uh, several surgeons and their patients, extracted thin slices, like 10 second long audio clips, ran those through an audio filter to remove all the words, right? So all you were left with was the tone of voice and the prosody, that melodic line that our voice does when we're, having, when we're saying something, we're having a conversation. So think high tech Charlie Brown's teacher, right? Um, and she played these 10 second clips to a group of naive observers who knew nothing about where these clips came from and asked them to rate those clips on a range of different traits, like how warm, how caring, how dominant, et cetera. And her data was able to show that more negative evaluations of those uh, clips were, could significantly accurately identify surgeons who had a history of being sued for malpractice. So partial information, this is no video even, it's not even words, right? Nobody knew what they were saying. It was just about that quality of the voice and that interactional quality. And she did similar work looking at silent videos and making predictions about that. So I was really, really fascinated by how you could pick up 
on just this partial interactional quality, right? Just tone of voice, just facial expressions with no verbal content whatsoever, and find that there were some really strong predictive qualities in there for social interactions uh, more broadly. So the very first study that I did that Claudia alluded to is over, alluded to is about a decade ago or so, is I had autistic and non-autistic kids retelling um, little stories. They were safari stories, so here on the bottom you have an, a non-autistic kid indicating that he's slightly worried about this lion that's about to attack. The kid at the top is autistic and he's, he is the lion. Um, they were asked to, to be expressive, so he's doing a good job there. Um, and actually, speaking of that, we found that overall the autistic kids were more expressive than the non-autistic kids. And I'm going to say that again because that that sort of tends to defy a lot of stereotypes that people have about autism being sort of monotonous, robotic. That is not at all what we found. We found that the autistic kids in this task were significantly more expressive. We have found that in other kinds of situations as well, as well, including in work done by um, a brilliant and beloved collaborator, Emily Zane. Shout out to the JMU listening uh, session over there. Um, and so when we extracted little clips from these videos, and I went really, really thin slice. I went all the way down to one second, showed those to a group of neurotypical adults, otherwise known as Emerson College undergrads. Um, and I said, was this person that you just saw and heard socially awkward or not? And that's all I asked. Never mentioned the word autism, didn't explain anything about the broader context. And what we found is that the autistic kids were significantly more likely to be rated as socially awkward than the non-autistic kids. Not 100% to 0%. Autism is, uh, I mean, um, awkwardness is not the exclusive domain of autism. We're all awkward at times, right? But a significant difference in how much more the autistic kids were rated to be socially awkward. And we've replicated this in a number of different ways. It's been replicated in a number of different labs with different populations, different methodologies. We've asked more socially relevant follow-up questions like, do you think this person gets along well with others? If you were a teenager, would you want to have lunch with this person, right? So questions that really talk about how willing are you to interact with this kid and what assumptions are you making about their ability to interact with others. Um, so I was really, really curious about what these kids are doing with their faces and voices that becomes so apparent within a single second. So I've been trying to quantify facial expressions and tone of voice since my PhD days. Um, and so to sum up a decade's worth of research, uh, this is infrared motion capture, so you can see the reflective markers on my face. And there are uh, cameras that record the movements of those markers at 100 frames per second over time. And so we can make judgments about the movements of the, of the facial features that these markers are attached to, their relative position to each other. We've used a number of different methodologies, different techniques, different technologies. And essentially what we're finding is that there are some significant differences in terms of timing, rhythm, rate. Um, synchrony and symmetry in the facial expressions and vocal expressions of autistic individuals compared to non-autistic individuals. And humans are actually pretty good at picking up on symmetry and synchrony and timing differences, so it kind of makes sense that that is something you could pick up on within even a second, right? That that could underlie some of those perceptions. But when we're having a conversation, we're not just looking at facial expressions in isolation, right? We're making judgments based on where we're at right now and what the conversation is that we're having right now. So the, the conversation partner's expectations are really, really important to how an expression is going to be perceived. So we looked into this by uh, showing a bunch of YouTube clips to autistic and non-autistic kids. Um, this being YouTube, you could find things that made people laugh and things to gross them out, mostly. That's what we could find. Um, and so we showed these video clips to autistic and non-autistic kids and just recorded their faces and said, just watch these clips. There was no task associated with that. And so what we then did is actually do frame-by-frame -frame coding of these expressions. So um, human beings looking at each frame of the video saying, was there an expression, and if so, was it a positive one or was it a negative one? Um, and so if you were playing along at home or in the room, right, this very first expression over here on the left, what do you think? Was he watching something funny and cute or something gross? 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 Okay, how about the next one? Gross. gross? Everybody agreed? No? Getting some ambiguity on that one? What about number three? Uh, funny. funny? And the last one? Gross, scared. We, we didn't. We didn't scare them. We just showed them, you know, gross stuff. Um, but so, trick question. Thank you all for playing along. They all were watching gross video clips at this time. 
And this ambiguity that you just experienced with the two in the middle who were autistic as opposed to the two at the edges who are non-autistic is what we're finding in a lot of the objective data as well. And, you can, and we're finding that the autistic kids, their facial expressions are more likely to be read as expressing something positive even when the context is negative. And you can imagine that if you're having a conversation with someone, you're telling them a, a sad story about your life and their facial expression reads to you like they're having a good time, that is not a conversation you're going to want to prolong or necessarily repeat, right? So this is the kind of thing that can lead to a communicative breakdown. And I just want to emphasize, I'm not talking about what these kids were experiencing at that time. It's just about what their facial expression is read as by somebody else, right? So this broader social and conversational context for facial expressions is what leads me to the project we're pursuing here. Um, and so quick note on terminology, sex is about biology, uh, gender is social cultural, right? It's about identity. In a lot of this research that I've been reading, especially within autism and, and other psychological fields as well, um, the terms kind of get used interchangeably. So I'm gonna try to be really precise about what I mean because both components show up in this work and they're both relevant to what I'm talking about. Um, and why, of all the possible intersectionalities, why talk about gender with regard to autism? Well, there's a couple of interesting things. One is about biological sex. And so when we're looking at sex ratios within autism, it depends on how we're looking, which answer we get. So if we're looking at, let's say, all the eight-year-olds who have an autism diagnosis, and we count all the boys and all the girls, biological sex, right? We're gonna find a four to one sex ratio, four boys to one girl. If we're doing a community-based uh, study where we're, we're saying we don't care who already has a diagnosis, we're just gonna give an autism assessment to all the eight-year-olds who live in this particular area, we're gonna find a three-to-one ratio. So already something's shifting, right? Something's different about who gets a diagnosis and whom could we diagnose if we actually just went out and looked at every kid. And then if we're relying on adults and to self-report their own autism diagnosis, the sex ratio actually shifts to almost even, one and a half to one, sometimes two to one, depends on who you ask. So there's something interesting going on here with related to biological sex, right? Remember, this is a developmental diagnosis. So these autistic women who are diagnosed as adults always had autism. They just weren't diagnosed formally before, right? So that's kind of interesting. But then in addition to that, there is a gender piece that shows up as well. Uh, which is articulated very well by one of our anonymous research assistants, uh, sorry, research participants who said, my gender is a gender. I don't have one, I don't understand it. Little did I know that that was partially because of my autism. So something interesting in how autistic people perceive their own gender and their own uh, neurotype as well. All right, and this seems to be related to the fact that autism is essentially a diagnosis of social behavior, right? Difficulties with social interaction, social, like that's what it's all about, all right? And we know that societal expectations from men and women are quite different from each other, right? And it's important to note that a lot of autistic individuals learn social behavior through very careful and somewhat more overt observation and conscious observation. And so they're more likely to recognize from a very young age how gendered social expectations are for people who live in different kinds of bodies, right? And then they might be more likely to very purposefully adopt the behavior and mimic the behavior that seems to be expected of people who have their kind of body. Um, and that's sort of referred to as camouflaging and masking, right? Sort of the, this, this taking on of behavior that isn't necessarily what I would do naturally, but it's what I see around me and what I expect, what I, what I understand is expected of me. Um, and in addition, that might also explain why more autistic individuals endorse gender diverse uh, identities than non-autistic individuals, right? So there's clearly some interrelatedness of gender and autism. And I love this quote by an autistic woman I met um, recently. She says, yes, I, def I identify as female, but not because I have strong feelings about it. It's because that is the gender role I have learned and it would be way too much work to try and learn another one. And then Anna Holt continues, my autistic husband and I have learned to mask one way, the way our society that we grew up in taught us gender is performed. And that has been hard enough. Trying to start over and learn another entire set of social rules, exhausting. Okay, so that is the reality, right, that a lot of autistic individuals live in. 
Which brings me to this work. And this was started by a former master's student, um, Megan Baer. This was her, uh, built on her thesis work. Um, and we've been um, expanding on this this year. So these data are hot off the presses. This is done in very generous collaboration with Julia Parrish Morris and Meredith Cola at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And here's what we did. We had 60 videos, 15 each of autistic girls, non-autistic girls, autistic boys, non-autistic uh, boys. And keeping in mind here, again, in the interest of clarity, what we know about these kids in the video is their biological sex as reported by their parents, right? Um, and these clips were seven to 10 seconds long. We extracted them from a five-minute conversation that these kids were having with a research assistant, like a getting to know you conversation. And we made sure that we had a couple of interactional exchanges there. So kid said something, RA said something, kid said something, RA said something, end of clip. Right? The RAs are not visible, you can just see the kid, but it's not a monologue, right? This is somebody actually having a conversation and an interaction, so you can get, capture that interactional quality as well. We showed those videos to 165 students at the University of Pennsylvania, and now what we know about the students who, or community members who uh, provided the ratings is their self-reported gender identity, right? So a bit of a mismatch between what we know about the participants who provided the ratings and the kids in the videos, which is obviously something we need to take into account. Um, and so we asked a number of questions. We asked six questions um, with slider bars. And we said, you know, be as honest as possible, provide your quick first impression or gut reaction. I've actually gotten some feedback from autistic individuals that gut reaction is not a terminology that resonates well with them, which I'm happy to talk about during Q&A as well. Um, but so we, we really, there were not questions, there were statements, right? And the, the people had slider bars to say how much they agreed with each of the statements. And the questions, the statements were, you know, it seems this person I communicate in a similar way. If I were a classmate of this person, I would be interested in spending time with them. Seems like um, conversation comes naturally to this, to this person. Seems like they get along well with others. Um, you know, it looks like somebody peers would enjoy spending time with, and it seems this person would be likely to start a conversation with others. What I expected is that the non-autistic kids would get, the videos, right, of non-autistic kids would get more favorable social ratings on these, on these questions than the autistic kids, and we also expected the girls to get more favorable ratings than the boys, and that sort of aligns with existing literature. And that is exactly what we found. So um, over here you have, uh, these two bars are the neurotypical kids, so the non-autistic kids. The ones, the bars over here are the autistic kids. The aqua color is the boys and the salmon color is the girls. And so you can find that overall, the autistic kids are rated less favorably on this, this so we did sort of a combined measure of all six of these questions. So the autistic kids are rated less favorably than the non-autistic kids and the girls are rated more favorably than the boys. So far, so expected. We then also added um, three slider bars for gender. And we provided a PFLAG definition of gender expression. And it's important, so we had three slider bars, one for femininity, one for masculinity, and one for neither other. Important that this was not a zero sum game. So you could move all of the slider bars all the way to the right if you wanted, or keep them all the way on the left. It, what you did with one slider bar had no impact on any of the others, okay? And what we found is not unexpected, right? The green bars are the boys, the purple bars are the girls, the boys are rated as more masculine than the girls. So far, so good. It gets more interesting when we look at it within diagnosis. So the darker, oops, that's the wrong, wrong direction, sorry. Um, the darker uh, bars here are the autistic boys and the lighter bars are the non-autistic boys and there's no difference in their masculinity ratings, right? So autism doesn't seem to have an impact on how boys the gender identity or the gender expression of boys is perceived by others. But when you look at the girls, you actually see that the darker purple here, those are the autistic girls, they're rated as significantly less feminine than the non-autistic girls. So autism does have an impact on this perceived gender of autistic girls, but not of boys. We then also looked at the neither other ratings, and this may, if you're eyeballing it, look like it's a relatively even distribution. It's not. Um, the autistic girls are rated significantly more neither other than any of the other groups, and there's no difference in how the other three groups are rated relative to each other. How do we think about these data? Well, 
Uh, this one I want to thank Nicole Knoll at, here at Harvard, uh, who had some wonderful conversations with me and referred me to Kira Hudson, who also had fantastic conversations with me um, at Berkeley. And she's doing some really exciting work on um, intersectionality of stereotypes. So let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, there are prescriptive stereotypes, things that everybody should do. These are good traits. Everybody should have them. Things like being cooperative and friendly and decisive and ambitious and athletic, right? These are all good things. And then there are proscriptive stereotypes, things that you shouldn't have or do, like being gullible or shy or arrogant or rebellious. Um, now, it gets more interesting when you look at it within groups, right? So there are relaxed and intensified versions of each of these stereotypes. So if you're looking at a relaxed prescriptive, those are the green ones, right? Relaxed prescriptive means that everybody should have this, but if you're a member of this group, it's a little bit more okay if you don't, right? So in this case, if you're a man, what do you think is a relaxed prescriptive? Like, you don't have to have it quite as much if you're a man. Thoughts? Cheerful, warm, friendly, yep, nailed it. Um, which means that on the other side, on the intensified prescriptive, right, assertive, athletic, ambitious, rational, these are traits that men in US society absolutely have to have. You really can't get away with not exhibiting those traits. Um, what about on the proscriptive side? So a relaxed proscriptive means that nobody should do this, but if you're a man, you can kind of get away with it a little bit more. Arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> yup. <laughs> it is true according to the research. So arrogant, <laughs> arrogant, rebellious, stubborn, those are relaxed proscriptive stereotypes for men. Um, but men really cannot get away with being gullible or shy, right? Those are not traits that is forgiven of them in US society. Very similar kinds of um, traits amongst women. And so I'm just, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna give them to you, you're gonna guess them anyway. But so relaxed prescriptives, um, so the ones that you don't have to have quite as much for women, intelligent, athletic, clever, principled, ambitious, right? which means that cooperative, warm, kind, friendly, polite, and cheerful are intensified prescriptive gender stereotypes for women in our society, right? These are the traits you absolutely have to have in order to get by. This is what's expected of you. And then if we look at the other side, so a relaxed proscriptive, the things that is a little bit more okay uh, – sorry, that you definitely – yes, sorry, it's a little bit more okay if you have this negative trait is gullible, emotional, or shy. Uh, but you definitely can't be re rebellious, arrogant, cynical, or stubborn, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, and just keep in mind that this is just an assort, right? Just, just a selection of all the stereotypes that are out there and that have been studied extensively for you know decades, etc. But so what became really apparent to me is I'm looking at this. If I'm looking at just the intensified prescriptives for women. Cooperative, warm, kind, friendly, polite, cheerful, also communal and wholesome, whatever that means. Um, but if you put that next to these social first impressions questions I've been asking, person gets along well with others, they communicate like me, conversation comes easily to them, peers enjoy spending time with them, they seem to be interested in spending time with others. There's a lot of overlap here, right? If you're friendly, polite, and cheerful, of course your peers are going to want to spend time with you. If you're cooperative, then yes, conversation is probably going to come more naturally to you, right? So there's a lot of interlinking here of what our society expects and demands of women and what we're looking for when we're asking, like, how socially capable do you think this person is? So where does this come into play for the data we collected? Well, we ran a bunch of correlations looking at the gender ratings and the social first impression rating that we, that we created. So what I'm about to show you are some... Um, some correlation graphs. So on this x-axis, you see femininity. Uh, so the further out you go, the more feminine somebody was rated as being. And on the y-axis, you have this first impression score. So the higher up you go, the more positive the evaluation of this person's social behavior was. Okay? And so if we plot the, um, the kids here on this, so these are the videos, right, of the kids. On this graph, so you see the blue lines over there are the boys. They're hanging out on the left end of the femininity scale, right, as makes sense. 
Over here is the girls. The, the straight lines, the continuous lines, are the autistic kids, and the dotted lines are the non-autistic kids. And what we find is that femininity is positively correlated with first impressions of social behavior. So the more feminine you are rated as being, the more at the same time you're also rated more positively on these social impression scores, which is actually not what I expected. Well, it is what I expected, but it's not what I expected for the boys. I kind of thought that if the gender rating lined up with your biological sex, the social ratings would go up. But it turns out that even for boys, being rated as more feminine is correlated with being rated more positively on these social um, measures as well. When we break it out into ind four individual groups, right, just the autistic boys, just the autistic girls, et cetera, et cetera, this correlation is only significant for the autistic girls. And it becomes apparent when I show you the entire graph, because I've been hiding some of it, this is what it actually looks like. So the autistic girls have a much wider range of being rated on this femininity scale, right? Um, and they're also the ones who are rated lower on femininity tend to also be rated lower on the social first impression. All right, so in the overall group, femininity was significantly positive related with, uh, with, this for, um, with uh, for first impression scores, but if you break it out like that, it looks a little bit different. So <clears throat> what about neither other ratings? Well, all the kids clustered over here on the left, right? Neither other on the x-axis. The more to the right you go, the more neither other somebody is rated as being. Overall, being perceived as neither other on the, on the gender scale is correlated with more negative social impressions. Right, it's a negative correlation, and that holds true for the overall group. When we break it out into the four individual group, it is only significant for autistic girls, and this is what the autistic girl graph looks like. So again, you have a much, much wider range for how kids, how autistic girls are rated on this, on this neither other gender measure, and then also how their corresponding <clears throat> social uh, behaviors are perceived. So looking at these data, amongst these four groups, I would say that autistic girls, biological sex, right, that's how, we, that's how they were defined, autistic girls seem to be uniquely vulnerable to this perceived gender, this perception of gender on the perception of their social behavior as well. What are the factors that are in play here? Well, for one, social communication deficits or difficulties violate expected gender norms for girls, right? So we, being communal, being friendly, being outgoing, being polite, all of those things are intensified prescriptive gender stereotypes for girls. We expect them of girls. Autism, by definition, is difficulties with social communication and social interaction, right? So overall, the autistic girls are being perceived more positively on these social measures than the non-autistic boys, but when they're not, when they're falling short of that, they're kind of getting hit in both the, um, the gender domain and that social domain, right? Now, if that's the case, though, why don't we have all these little girls being brought in for autism evaluations, right? If, if there's all these three-year-olds and four-year-old girls who are not communicating the way our society expects little girls to communicate, why aren't we bringing them in and saying something's not quite right here, right? And well, part of that is because autistic girls are better at camouflage, and there's been a lot of uh, literature on that. They're better at mimicking and taking on these behaviors, sort of pretending, play acting these behaviors in some ways that they see others do. So superficially, they look somewhat better than the boys. And yes, their social ratings were higher than those of the autistic boys, so we do see that in play. But it comes at a tremendous cost. These girls are exhausted, right, to try and pretend behavior that is not necessarily your natural expression is really, really hard to maintain that all day. So it does come at a cost. But we are asking these autistic girls to continue to use all these social skills and this masking behavior in order to fit in, in order to look more typical, so to speak, right? Why do we make them do that? Well, because, well, there was a paper published last year by the title, Autism, Thy Name is Man, um, the medical and educational community still expect autism to be something that boys have and not necessarily something that girls have. And we've been carrying that, that male autism bias since the 1940s, right? And it still persists. And there is evidence showing that um, 
Pediatricians who do like routine screenings for signs of autism at 18 months or so are much more likely to dismiss um, signs that could indicate an autism diagnosis if it's a girl compared to if it's a boy. So there is a, a persistent male bias in this, entire, um, in this entire system that holds some of these girls back from, uh, from getting a diagnosis. Uh, in addition, I think some of these gender stereotypes play in as well because it's easier to explain some of these early signs of autism away as being something else, like she's just shy, she's being anxious, she's emotional. If you think about what are intensified proscript, sorry, relaxed proscriptive stereotypes for girls, right? Negative traits that you can get away with having if you're a girl, shy, emotional, melodramatic. So some of these behaviors that you could see in a young autistic kid can be pushed off on this gender stereotype rather than put uh, linked up with autism because we still think of autism as a thing for boys, right? So again, we're asking, therefore, these girls, because we're basically saying there's nothing wrong with you, right? So we're asking them to continue camouflaging, continue masking, continue putting in all that effort. And it leads to also sort of gender as a more overt social performance, right? Because they have to acquire not just, you know, neutral social behavior, but gendered social behavior. And it becomes part of this camouflaging um, that they do, which can also help explain why Yes, there's more gender diversity in the autism community in general, but it's particularly apparent amongst those who are assigned female at birth. So there is something about autistic women who, who sort of think about these gendered stereotypes and their own social behavior and their gendered social behavior in a different way um, and then lead to comments such as this. Um, I didn't, this is one of our research uh, participants, right? I didn't really understand gender the way other people did. Felt super performative. I always assumed that everybody was just going along with these gender rules the same way that I was. Like, I don't think anybody, I didn't think anybody took it seriously. I love that part. I didn't think anybody took it seriously. I figured when I didn't follow these guidelines, people would get, would get upset, and so I just stuck with it. And I thought that's what everyone was doing but that's not what they were doing. So a very overt acceptance, right, of this gender role that you're supposed to perform um, that is also can lead to exhaustion, to burnout, to a lot of negative um, mental health impacts for autistic women. So why are we missing those girls? Well, if you're thinking back to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, fifth edition, DSM-5, right, two domains of autism diagnosis, Social conversation, social interaction is one of them. Well, we just saw that girls are better at masking, right? They look superficially better. So it kind of hides some of the difficulties that they actually have. Um, and in addition, these, some of these gender stereotypes, especially these relaxed proscriptive gender stereotypes of, you know, she's just shy or emotional, can contribute to girls being missed for a diagnosis, in addition to this male diagnostic bias that we also have, right, that the medical and educational communities still carry. And then if we look at the restrictive repetitive behaviors um, and stereotypes, which we really haven't talked about, but it's a topic uh, that's been becoming more, uh, more overt lately in the autism field. And um, one of the things that's being highlighted a lot is that the topics of these restricted interests are different for girls or women than they are for boys or men. So a lot of what, what people expect to see is, again, still carried you know, since the 1940s, like little boys playing obsessively with trucks and talking about dinosaurs, which you don't have to be autistic to be a three-year-old who's into trucks and dinosaurs, right? Um, and not only boys are into those things, some girls are into those things as well. But a lot of girls are also into other things like makeup and dress up and, you know, talking about ponies. And so those are not the topics that people look for when they're trying to determine whether something is a stereotype behavior or a special interest. Um, so these topics defy expectations. And I, at some point, said this um, in the lab and um, said that, you know, no physician or nobody's going to refer an eight-year-old girl for an autism diagnosis just because she can sing along to the entire Taylor Swift Eras tour. 
Um, and when I said this, one of the autistic students in the lab laughed and said, well, yes, but I know way too much about Taylor Swift. For example, I know that she was born on December 13th, 1989 at 5.17 a.m. on the fourth floor of the maternity ward of the West Reading, Pennsylvania Hospital, and that's not normal. Okay, so what do we need to do? What do we need to actually look for if we want to change some of this equation? Well, on the social communication domain, we have to not just look at how well are they do performing, but also we have to look at their effort and we have to look at their success. How hard are these girls working in order to make it look like they're fitting in? And how well are they really fitting in? A lot of autistic girls have gotten really good at standing near groups of girls and sort of doing what they're doing. So superficially from a distance, they look like they're fitting in, but they're not really integrated into that group of girls. So how successful are they in these, in these communicative bids? Um, in terms of repetitive behaviors, we have to look at the intensity and the exclusivity of that activity regardless of what the topic is, right? Like, are you doing whatever this is and only that to the exclusion of all else? Then we might be able to talk about a stereotyped interest, right, a repetitive behavior, regardless of what the topic is. And then more broadly, we really have to talk about these gendered expectations in the medical environment, in educational environments, and in the social realm as well, and how all of these behaviors, these social behaviors, are perceived by those around them depending on what kind of a body you inhabit, right? So what's next for some of this work? So glad you asked. Um, I'm going to do, so this year we've been spending a lot of time collecting videos of autistic adults um, who are talking actually about their journey to diagnosis. They're really interesting videos. Uh, and we want to do some thin slice judgments uh, based on those videos. And the reason those, I'm excited about those videos is because we have much richer gender identity information about the people in those videos, and they represent a broader range of gender identities as well. So we don't have to rely on biological sex, boys versus girls, in making these judgments, right? But really about self, um, self-identified gender and a broad range of gender identities as well. So I'm really excited about moving forward with that. Um, also, I have a master's student right now at Emerson, Kay Connors, who wants to get into some qualitative work, looking at the narratives of the adults in those videos, and specifically, specifically at community. Right? If you're a gender-diverse autistic adult, where, where do you find your community? Is it amongst the gender-queer community? Is it amongst the autism community? Some combination thereof? How, is that, how does that manifest? Um, and then lastly, I'm really excited to be part of a... Um, newly funded NIH project called Connect with a dream team of collaborators across multiple institutions. And we're going to be recording conversations of several hundred adolescents um, and within this double empathy model. So an autistic kid talking to an autistic kid, a non-autistic kid talking to a non-autistic kid, one autistic, one non-autistic talking to each other, and trying to get a really good handle on what does the language look like in these different types of interactions? What do the facial expressions look like? How is the what, what is the impact of having conversations across or within neurotype for all of these different social signals that we send each other and how comfortable we are in the conversation as well. And with that, I thank you. Gosh, I loved it. Thank you. <laughs> This I'm is glad. so fascinating. Uh, let's see. There are lots of questions, but feel free to ask more. Um, so there are a few questions about the data. Mm -hmm. So let's clarify a few things there. Uh, I wonder if the findings that autistic women are perceived as less feminine than non-autistic women is potentially due to differences in diagnosis i.e. more masculine autistic women are more likely to be diagnosed with autism? That's a really good question. Um, I don't have an answer for that, um, but it is a good question. And there's, you know, there's always this problem when you're looking at um, autistic women who are not diagnosed because you gotta find them first, 
right? Like anything that we find out about autistic women is because they already have a diagnosis. And so we're already missing, right? Our, our sample is already biased. Um, and so I don't know that they're more masculine necessarily, but it also depends on how you define masculine, right? Mm -hmm. If we're talking about autistic girls who have maybe less strong social skills, then yes, I believe that is true. And there's definitely evidence saying that um, autistic girls need to have more significant autistic behaviors in order to get a diagnosis than autistic boys, right? So there is, there's a higher threshold. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, if we're going with the data that I just showed you, right, that that might translate also in more perceived masculinity because it's less socially voluble, uh, then I think that could definitely hold. Mm -hmm. um, for your plots of first impression scores versus gender scale, mm -hmm. Do any differences emerge when you disaggregate based on the gender of their rater? <clears throat> That's the next step. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to look at the data set that we have right now and try to figure out statistically what the best way is of doing that. Um, again, it's a little bit of a mismatch, right? Because we have gender identity for the raters and biological sex for the kids being rated. So I think that might be something that we can do better with an, a new data set that has equal uh, measures of gender, but it's definitely something to think about. And then you kind of have to push it beyond gender as well, right? If we're talking about first impressions, um, there's this in-group versus out-of-group feature, right? And it's not just about my gender, it could be about my race, my ethnicity, my age, my whatever else, right? So um, how am I going to rate somebody who is more like me in whichever domains and metrics I'm, I can think about versus somebody who is not. So that's definitely the next step for mm -hmm. some of this work. You just have to figure out exactly what the right data set is to do that on and right. the right statistical approach. Yeah. So on the intro study on autistic children being more expressive, kids <coughs> look late, school age, early middle. In this is this related to neurotypical children at this age being super self-conscious <laughs> and less likely to emote on demand? I, does this affect uh, effects hold across ages? It's a great question, and I'm so glad this question got asked because it gives me opportunity to talk about a study I had to cut out of the presentation. So, um, so the, the first one that I showed you, uh, there definitely, I'm, I'm convinced that there is an effect of age. The 12-year-old, the we had an age range from like 11 to 17, something like that. And the littler kids, the 11, 12-year-olds, autistic or non-autistic, they were kind of, they, they were going for it, right? They were having fun. We set this whole thing up as, you know, this guy who tells these safari stories on TV is going on vacation. He's auditioning a vacation replacement. So here's a camera, like, go for it, right? Entertain the kids at home. Um, and then when we got to the 17-year-olds, a lot of the facial expressions of the non-autistic 17-year-olds were like, dear Lord, this is the most embarrassing thing I've ever had to do in my life. I, let me just get it done with and get out of here, right? Whereas the 17-year-old autistic kids were still going for it. They were having fun, right? Um, and there, there's a little bit of that social understanding there as well, of like learning that as a 17-year-old, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. Maybe that's just not cool. Um, but the autistic kids were just doing it. Now, separately from that, though, um, the aforementioned brilliant collaborator, Emily Zane, um, we did, so the, the, uh, the study that I showed you with the facial expressions in response to YouTube, um, she did an overall analysis that just showed that the autistic kids were significantly more expressive in response to these users in response to these YouTube clips than the non-autistic kids. Across everything, they were talking to themselves, they were laughing out loud, they were making facial expressions, all manner of things were going on. And the scenario was such that the kid was sitting there watching these videos, and then behind sort of a short wall around the corner is where the research assistant sat. And they said, you know, you watch these clips, I'm just gonna like go over here and do something on a computer, right? So they were still in the room, but not visible. So Emily was asking this question of, okay, are the autistic kids exaggerating their expressions because they're sort of trying to still have a relationship with this research assistant who we all know is still in the room, right? So they're like emoting loudly in order to bring that person into the conversation. Or in contrast, are the non-autistic kids saying, well, there's a person in the room, so I'm just gonna like keep it low, mm -hmm. right? And so she very cleverly repeated the study. She did the same thing again, found the same findings, which is always exciting when that happens, mm -hmm. and then did a second version with the same participants where the research system just left the room, said, you know, I'm just going to leave the room, 
left the room, closed the door behind them. The kids are absolutely by themselves. And what you found was that the neurotypical kids, the non-autistic kids did exactly the same thing. There was no difference in how responsive they were. So this is not about non-autistic kids being self-conscious. There was nobody else in the room at this moment. The autistic kids got even more expressive than they had been when the research assistant was still in the room, huh. right? So when they're left to their own devices, when it's, and there's no, remember, there's nothing social on this, mm -hmm. right? There's no social demands. There's no language demands. Mm -hmm. It's just them watching YouTube clips and having a good time. And they were significantly more expressive even when they were completely mm -hmm. alone, even, you know, even more expressive when they were completely alone. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the non-autistic kids suppressing. They were the same across both conditions. Mm -hmm. The autistic kids were more expressive in both and even more expressive when they were completely by themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a couple of questions about geographical areas, so let me, let me tell them what they are. So are there uh, differences in the gender ratio of diagnosed autistic children between different countries or cultures, which could, el could elucidate why autistic girls tend to be underdiagnosed? There are definitely some differences, but it also depends on the methodology, and it depends on each country's culture and the stigma around autism, right? If you're, if you're looking for only kids who are referred for a diagnosis and you're operating in a country that has a very strong stigma against autism, you're gonna find fewer kids, right? So there, yes, there are differences, but it's gonna, it, it depends on a wide range of factors, mm -hmm. um, and it's not so easy to figure out what aspect of that has to potentially do with sex or gender. Right, and the second question, which is about geography, it's uh, regarding the um, uh, first impression scores and femininity ratings. And this person is asking whether there, are, there have been, um, ident the differences have been uh, noticed and identified across different regions of the United States. Oh, um, well, so that particular study actually is done exclusively in Philadelphia, so mm -hmm. it's a very restricted area of the United States. Um, it'll be interesting to see this, um, this data set of autistic adults that we're putting together, this sort, of, sort of thinking of it as a library of videos of autistic adults. Um, those are from across the US, um, and we wanna do the ratings for those online as well, so that'll be another factor mm -hmm. to consider. And I think you know, there's a lot to be said, thinking about this in-group versus out-of-group piece, right? If you're detecting a regional accent or a regional dialect and you share that same dialect, right? You're, you're in-group on that, so that might also alter what your perception of, of that person is. So there's a, once, you, once you broaden um, that geographic area, you're also adding another variable that yeah. becomes relevant for investigation, so. Yeah, you have to take it into account. Um, can you speak a bit about the age at which kids tend to internalize these stereotypes? At what age do autistic girls tend to start realizing they need to ma match certain stereotypes? And at what age do neurotypical people develop these gut reactions, first impressions about normal behaviors? Um, all right, so those are... I, I I'm gonna treat those as two separate questions, mm -hmm. right? The gut reaction piece and then at what age do kids realize? And I think that varies greatly and I don't know that there are clear data on that as well. And for some of them, like for a lot of autistic kids, yes, they're, they're learning more purposefully, effortfully, consciously, but they're not necessarily aware that that is any different of what anybody else is doing, right? So like that, that quote you, you saw earlier of like, I just thought that's what everybody was doing. I, I didn't think anybody took this seriously. I figured that's, you know, we're all doing the same thing. And then at some point you realize that that is not true. So, um, and a lot of autistic women will talk about at some point recognizing that they had been masking all this time, but not necessarily having been aware of it the entire time. Um, I actually had, had this great experience where I was um, soliciting um, videos of autistic adults and, and this one person contacted me and said, um, I'm happy to do these videos, do you want me to mask or not? I'm like, oh, we need to talk. Like this is really, I, I wanna, like can you flip this as a switch? Like how does this work, right? So we had this great conversation, she's now part of our advisory, our, our autism advisory board for, uh, for this new grant. Uh, had this great conversation about what it means to mask and whether she really could put it on for the videos that we were collecting, which turned out to be difficult because one aspect of masking is that you don't talk about autism 
um, and you mimic other people. And so here she was alone in a video talking about autism and that made it, you know, that changed the equation significantly. Mm -hmm. But so I think that age of awareness comes differently for different people. Right. Um, the second question about gut reactions. So I said earlier, I got some feedback, like autistic people don't have gut reactions. Um, and that's what autistic people told me. And then of course I had other autistic people tell me, well, that's not true. So, um, you know, just again, autism is as, as varied as non-autism is, right? So people are gonna have very different opinions. But a lot of them have talked about like this, the terminology of gut reaction implies that you're somehow listening to your body and that your body is telling you what to do. And some autistic people have difficulty with that, like knowing when they're hungry or thirsty or tired or things like that. So therefore just that, that term, right, of listening to your gut kind of goes counter to, their, to what they're comfortable with. So then some people said, you know, just say, say the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, and then I had, I had a shared document that was being shared around amongst autistic people and then somebody put in the margins, just don't ask me to tell you the first thing that comes to my mind. So we're still kind of uh, workshopping what the right way is of framing this and there's never gonna be one way that is gonna work perfectly for everybody, but we are definitely taking that somatic experience, right, that gut reaction piece out of it. So at the uh, beginning of your talk, you mentioned neurodiversity. Uh, when you mentioned neurodivers the neurodiversity movement, you said that autism was a type of diversity, but also a disability. Mm -hmm. That seems contradictory. Can you talk more about that? Um, yeah. So neurodiversity is, uh, this movement has been around for a while, and this is not just about autism, right? There's a lot of people, like ADHD can be part of neurodiversity. There's a number of different, uh, different conditions like that. And so the idea is that um, when you're talking about autistic people, right, they have, their brains work somewhat differently. This is an aspect of human diversity. Um, and the expectation is that from the social model, that if neurotypical individuals in society in general could adapt, right, and be more welcoming and more supportive of neurodivergent needs, then autistic people, amongst other neurodivergent people, could function more smoothly um, in society. But there can still be aspects of the diagnosis that remain as barriers for autistic individuals. I had, for example, years ago, I taught an undergraduate course on autism, and there was an autistic student um, in the class, and this was right around the time that this DSM-5 came out, which changed how autism is diagnosed and sort of did away with the diagnosis of Asperger's and, and um, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, so everything is now under autism spectrum disorder. And this man, young man had previously had a diagnosis of Asperger's and was now classified as autistic. So other students asked him, he was very open talking about his autism, so other students asked him, like, how do you feel about that? And he said, thank you for acknowledging that I have a disability. He said, I'm really tired of people telling me that I'm lucky that I only have Asperger's. Um, and he said, some days, because there's a lot of sensory uh, issues in autism as well, where autistic people can be either overwhelmed by small amounts of sensory information or need a lot of sensory input in order to feel grounded. And he said, that sometimes when he gets out of bed in the morning, like he can't get out of bed in the morning because the thought of the soles of his feet touching the carpet mm -hmm. is too much for him to handle. No societal adaptation is going to mitigate that, right? So there are aspects of autism that are going to remain as barriers for autistic individuals and can constitute a disability. So the two models don't have to be mutually exclusive. Mm. There is actually a question following up on these uh, sensi sensory sensitivities. And this person asks, have you considered how the ability to perform female gender signals, for example, time spent um, <coughs> on wearing makeup, fragrance, high heels, high selling, et cetera, is affected by sensory sensitivities of them present in autistic individuals? Yeah, no, that's a very valid question. And, um, and it's entirely possible that, you know, if, if smell is one of the senses that mm -hmm. is overwhelming to you, you're, you're not gonna be wearing fragrances for sure. Mm -hmm. um, there's a great movie called Autism in Love. I don't know if anybody has seen it. Um, I highly recommend it, I really enjoy it. But it's, it's, um, <clears throat> it's a documentary of uh, several autistic adults in their relationships. And one woman actually talks about, so she wears very large jewelry 
something I can relate to. She wears you know, very large necklaces and things, and she talks at some point in this film about the reason she wears them, this, these large necklaces and this, this heavy jewelry, is as a barrier between her and, and the outside world, right? So there's, mm. I think different people find ways mm -hmm. to navigate how they can feel more comfortable, whether that is omitting something, like a fragrance or whatever, or adding something that also signals femininity in some ways, right? Lots mm -hmm. of jewelry uh, really depends on, on what that person's sensory experiences are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one very quick question, La. So, um, race and ethnicity in autism. So, can you tell us a little bit about the difference in diagnosis? And also, there is a question about gender expectations, which are different by race. And whether you have considered those in your research. Yeah, so um, at this point, the, um, the incidence of autism seems to, in, in the US seems to have equalized across different races. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily when you look at two-year-olds because there are still disparities in access to healthcare, right? So a lot of uh, kids who are non-white get diagnosed later, but by the time you look at 10 and 12-year-olds, it has pretty much equalized. So, right, there's, there's still issues, but it's not about not recognizing that autism also occurs in people who are not white. Originally, the expectation was, right, in the 1940s, it was white boys of affluent, um, highly educated families. That was the definition of autism. So that race piece and that ethnicity piece has changed since then. Um, it's definitely an aspect of intersectionality I want to look at next. Um, definitely starting with gender because there's just such an interrelatedness of gender and autism by definition. Um, but in these videos that we're collecting of autistic adults, I'm also hoping to get a broader re representation of race and ethnicity so that we can do similar kinds of studies on that. Yeah. Just not quite there yet. Wonderful. Ruth, thank you so much for thank you. presenting us. Uh, with your results and fascinating research. Um, I want to thank the audience for joining us and for asking these terrific questions. Um, I hope you all, you're going to be able to join us for our Radcliffe events. You can find video of past events and future dates of future events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you very much for joining us today and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.